Good evening, church family. Welcome to Refuge on Wednesday night. Uh, I tell you how we want to begin. If you want to, if you want to take a few minutes, those of you who are just feeling a little fire to pray and get ready for what God's going to do tonight, if you would join me, those of you that feel like it, if you want to join me around the front, uh, I just want to spend four or five minutes seeking the Lord uh, up here around the front as we get ready to worship tonight. Uh, just, just kind of in agreement, close together here. So those of you who are uh, who, who are inclined, I would welcome you to just come around and join us and let's all just uh, begin to believe God to do something powerful in the room tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we draw near. thank you that the new wine requires new wine skins but lord we thank you tonight you're making us into the new wine skin lord you're shaking off of us that which would hinder us from having what you want for us now and lord every hindrance is being broken lord and all the old wine skins are being broken and now the new wine is being poured in by faith we believe it we claim it and we welcome lord the outpouring of your spirit we welcome your voice. We welcome your touch, oh God. And we thank you that heaven is in this room because you're here. And Lord, we interact with you. Lord, we, we are hungry and thirsty after you. And we thank you, Lord, that because we are, we'll be filled.
field. We thank you that lives change in this room tonight. We thank you your voice is heard in this room tonight. And Lord, beyond this room, what you do in us is going to carry into a world that needs it. And we bless you for it. And now, Jesus, we lift you high and declare there's no one greater and no one better than you. And Lord, we lift you to your throne and we exalt you and we honor you, great King. Hallelujah. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. All right, let's worship together and lift up Jesus as we do it. Hallelujah. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. Oh, this is my testimony from dead to life. This grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters. Fought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony from dead to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony from dead to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters. Fought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony from dead to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. This is my testimony. From death to life, this grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony 
from death to life. His grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come, oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Because greater things are still to come, oh, I believe. This is my testimony from death to life. This grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life. His grace rewrote my story. I'm justified. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. on give him praise aren't you glad that he saved you and he changed you that he rewrote your story hallelujah I will sing of your goodness, I will sing of your love, though the seasons come quickly, you have always been enough, till the night make it darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love. You are good in the morning I sing you are good in the evening I sing you are good you are good to me you have always been patient you have always been kind. You're consistent through the ages. Oh, what a friend of mine. So I'll remind my soul of bliss to standing firm upon this truth. Knowing you cannot be shaken. Cause I've seen what you can do. And oh, you are good. In the morning I sing you are good. In the evening I sing you are good. You are good to me. You are good. In the morning I sing you. Good in the evening, I sing you are good. You are good to me. You have always been patient, you have always been kind. You're consistent through the ages. 
Oh, what a friend of mine. So I remind my soul to bless you, standing firm upon this truth. Knowing you cannot be shaken, because I've seen what you can do. In the morning I sing, you are good. In the evening I sing, you are good. You are good to me. Oh, you are good. In the morning I sing. Express to him the different ways in which he's good to you, Father. I want to thank you that you are good because you have saved and you have delivered. You have raised me. Oh, you work in all things for us.
one of the functions in the Old Testament of the priests is that they would proclaim the blessing of the Lord on the people. And tonight, that's what I feel uh, like we want to do during this moment of this prayer time is to just, I just want to bless you. I just want to pronounce blessing, the blessings that God's word says he intends for you. I just want to declare that over your life. Um, it is not greedy to ask God to bless you. There was a man named Jabez who the Bible says prayed a very bold prayer. He came from a life and really his name that indicated the pain that was evident at his birth. And he carried that name that, that seemed to be the evidence that he would always be connected to pain. But the Bible says he became real bold and he asked God to bless him and move him beyond pain. And the Bible says God did what he asked. It's okay to ask God to bless you because what it really means is this. It means you recognize that you're in need of his touch, his strength, his everything because you can't do it without him. So there's some part of us, the religious part of us, that when we ask God to bless us, it feels like we're almost doing something wrong. That's the exact thing we need to be doing is to ask God to bless us because it says, God, I'm empty, but you're full. I'm weak, but you're strong. God, I might not have it, but you have it all. And so when we're asking God to bless us, that's no different than your child asking you for help. So, of course, he's going to bless. So I want you to re just receive that, that tonight God is a blessor and he intends to bless his children. Father, as the leader over this house tonight, as shepherd, as pastor, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I come to declare over your people that what your word says about them being blessed is true, that they are blessed in covenant with you going in and coming out, rising up and lying down. Lord, I declare over them that they are blessed in the city and they're blessed in the field. I declare that their homes are blessed because your presence is there. I declare that their minds are blessed with peace and order because you didn't give a spirit of confusion but power, love, and a sound mind. Lord, I declare that we are blessed in our finances because you provide for all of our need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I, I declare that your people in this room are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ as your word declares. I I declare over them that they are blessed to be seated like Ephesians says in you in the heavenly places Lord we are not even subject to this earth Lord I bless this, this family oh God before me that they are seated in the heavenly place above the, the powers and the enemy that's against them Lord I bless them that they have wisdom because your word says when we ask it, you that you give it to us and so Lord I bless this house that we are blessed with the wisdom of God and not of men I bless your people tonight that they are full and not empty because your word says if we're hungry and thirsty after righteousness, we are filled and we're blessed. Lord, your word also declares in the great sermon you preached that day on the mountain, Lord, you declared that those who mourn are even blessed, not because something bad has happened, but they're blessed in that in their mourning, you will be comforting them. Lord, so even in tragedy, difficulty, and pain, Lord, the blessing is that you are faithful and you are present help in the time of trouble. Lord, I bless your people in this room with the joy of the Lord. Your word says it is our strength. And so, Lord, it is in your presence where there is fullness of joy. So, Lord, in your presence tonight, we declare that your people have your joy. Lord, we thank you tonight that in you we are fully blessed. Everything that we need supplied in you lord we're grateful for it we celebrate it and we're going to act like we're blessed father we're going to act like we have what we need we're going to act like that you're a faithful god and when we obey you you back up your word lord because you always do because one of the greatest blessings of all is that you've given us your great word and lord you've shown us what is true and lord i thank you that your promises are yes and in you there amen so, Lord, we are blessed. Most of all, we are blessed to be your children, blessed to be covered in the blood of Jesus, robed in his righteousness. Thank you for blessing us, Father. We continually need that blessing, and we thank you for it. And we're going to walk aware of it and thankful for it. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Tell three people as you head to your seat, you're blessed, you're blessed, you're blessed. Hallelujah. That'll preach right there. You're blessed. Sometimes you just need to be reminded that you are. Because the enemy, thank you, I am. I sure am. Because the enemy will try to make you believe you're not. He'll try, to believe, he'll try to make you believe that you're the tail and not the head. He'll try to make you believe that you're going to be defeated when Jesus says you're victorious. So sometimes you just need to be reminded you're blessed, and you are. And if you're watching in with us tonight, if you're joining us online, you're blessed. Because, uh, because there's this way for us to be connected uh, through this streaming. And so we're thrilled that you are here being part of this service. And I hope that you're interacting with us uh, tonight with comments and, and whatever you may need. We'll be glad to pray with you if you let us know it. And uh, we're thrilled that you're here as well. I am excited uh, for guests and uh, folks who are here tonight, maybe even for the first time. Uh, it is a true honor to worship with you. You could have been anywhere tonight, and yet here you are with us at Refuge. And we're thrilled that you decided to make this your place tonight of worship. If you are a guest, would you do, would you do a, a great service? Would you be willing to fill out that card that's in front of you uh, in one of the chairs? And uh, let that come to us when you leave the sanctuary tonight. There's boxes. If you would just deposit that in that box, what we're going to do is we're going to thank you for being here tonight. And, uh, and we're not going to harass you, but we are going to thank you. And uh, we would love uh, to get to connect with you in that way uh, tonight. I want to remind you of all the exciting things. Seniors, uh, you've got a luncheon coming up at Friday, uh, on Friday at 11 a.m. here in the smack. Uh, so don't forget about that. Uh, this Sunday night is Revival Night. Uh, fourth Sunday night's always Revival Night. And uh, I'm going to get to be preaching this one. So I will guarantee you I will come. Uh, I will not come wet. I will not soak your wood. Uh, I will come ignite your wood if you'll just bring some to the fire. Um, so we will, I'll have revival if you'll have it with me, 5 o'clock Sunday night. Um, all right, Resurrection Sunday, just around the corner. And, uh, you know, every time we meet on Sunday, it is the Lord's Day, and it is the Lord's Day because that's the day he rose from the grave. So we're celebrating the resurrection every Sunday, but we're really going to celebrate uh, in, uh, in two Sundays coming up here. Uh, so we're excited about that at 10 o'clock. And, of course, remember that your assignment is to help me fill every chair. And I've been seeing people uh, inviting folks, and they're telling me who they've invited and who's promised to come and all of those things. And so it's going to be an exciting day. There's surprises in that service for you that are going to be, uh, that are going to bless you tremendously. But if you are inviting folks to service, and you are, I uh, saying that by faith, if you'd like something in your hand, in both lobbies, we've got uh, invitation cards you can utilize. It's got the times, location, all of that. So you can put something in somebody's hand and uh, let them know about it. And so take, uh, take as many of those as you want in either one of the lobbies and use those to uh, get people invited to resurrection. Also, our Good Friday service on the 29th at 7 o'clock will be here, and, uh, and that's uh, communion that evening. And that has been the last few years when we've had these services. They have been tremendous services, and uh, we'll be uh, partaking communion together that night and uh, celebrating what Jesus did at the cross. And so we're excited about that. One final thing. On resurrection, uh, we are uh, baptizing folks. We've got a lot of folks that's already planning to be baptized. If you would like to be baptized in water, we are going to be uh, baptizing that day. If you'd let the office know, uh, just call during the business hours and let us know. That'll help. Uh, or I believe I was told we can, you can go to the website and sign up online, which is even uh, even maybe better because we've got a record because we've got something we're going to give you and then we'll know about it. Uh, to expect that, but uh, uh, if you want to be baptized, that will be a great way to celebrate that day. We're going to worship the Lord with our giving tonight and our tithes, our offerings, missions, commitments, whatever you are giving tonight, uh, and uh, we're excited because this is not just a moment in the service uh, to do an obligation and move on. This is a moment in the service where we worship God with one more dimension of our lives, and it happens to be through our finances as we finance the kingdom of God. So tonight you can give, utilize in those envelopes in front of you and uh, leave those in the boxes as you depart the sanctuary. Uh, you can uh, go online, you can use our kiosk in the East Lobby, or you can use the QR code and give right now. That'll take you to the right.
right place, and uh, you'll be able to uh, tithe and sow. But let the Lord direct you in your giving. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you that you are more than faithful to us. Thank you, God, that in every way you have proven yourself to be a provider. And Lord, for us as individuals and for this church, you have again and again provi provided and proved that you will supply every need. So Lord, now... We are grateful to uh, partner with you with our finances, tithing and sowing, believing you for a tremendous harvest of souls to come here and around the world. And we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you tithe and as you sow uh, tonight. A few things that uh, I want to update you on as far as what God's been doing in the last week at Refuge. Um, uh, just before service tonight, I was, uh, we were called out. Uh, because one of our members from uh, the Mark Tree campus uh, was in town in the hospital and uh, they had uh, had stroke symptoms. Uh, they had every, every kind of thing going on. Uh, they couldn't, couldn't speak. Body was drawn up, pain everywhere, um, uh, numbness and uh, face was, was drawing and uh, had been sick all day and then just it turned into this thing. They rushed over here. Uh, to the hospital and got him in the ER and of course when we found out we began to uh, pray immediately for that to, for every I just was commanding every symptom to cease the root of it to go and uh, normalcy to come immediately and uh, but it but it was it was very concerning got her to the ER and they rushed her right back into a CT scan uh, because they were concerned that it was a stroke at the ER as well and uh, got her back there and so that's when I came in as they had just I went to the ER that I had just got uh, when I got there she they just taken her uh, for the CT scan and the time it took her uh, to go through the scan and then then put her in an ER room and the husband went back and then in just a minute uh, they called for me to go back I walked back there she's sitting up talking completely normal every symptom pretty much gone she's back to thinking talking clearly her body's relaxed everything's used and and uh, and they said uh, they said what we know it is not is a stroke <laughs> and uh, so uh, so I'm just thankful uh, so that was that was just today God just moving and taking care of his people but uh, uh, another one a testimony I want to give you from West uh, there's a, a member of the church family over there about 90 years old been in the hospital some time with congestive heart failure and pneumonia and other issues uh, I was just looking uh, not too many days ago, it was looking not real good for him. And uh, there was a Sunday a couple of weeks ago when there were several healings at West. And uh, the Monday after that, the, the next day, Pastor David went and, uh, and to the hospital, anointed him and prayed over him. And, uh, and, and in the couple of weeks since then, uh, he, he, he began immediately to get better. Now the pneumonia is gone. His strength and breathing are back to normal. Uh, he's, he's now uh, in, uh, he's in uh, rehab and he's taken 15 hours a week of physical therapy about 90 years old, and, uh, and so the Lord has turned that around in just, uh, just a couple of weeks off of what could have been a deathbed, and um, it's been a resurrection kind of situation. Uh, this past Sunday morning, four people accepted the Lord here as their Savior in our service, and that's ex always exciting. And then a story that you'll get the entire, uh, you'll get the entire story because uh, I'm going to make sure you get all of it at some point, but I can't not talk about the fact that Sunday morning uh, in the hospitality room, a lady comes in and uh, whips out her phone, shows me a text, and uh, she has been praying for her son to come to the Lord for 20 years. And uh, she received a call on Friday. He's accepted the Lord. He's, he and I have already talked because he's coming from out of state to be baptized here. So I just can't help but tell you about that. Don't give up. Whatever you do, don't give up. Uh, so I was, I was so encouraged by that and excited about it. You're going to get the whole story on that before long, but, uh, but I had just had to tell you tonight. Turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. And suddenly there came 
a sound from heaven. Now, I know that we usually read right on because we're good Pentecostals and we, we're, we're, getting to the, uh, we're getting to the Holy Spirit baptizing everybody and they all spoke with tongues. and we're, we, we, we skip ahead to that. But hold on. There came a sound from heaven. Heaven has a sound. Heaven has a sound. And tonight we're moving back to that message that we began some weeks ago to listen. We're listening now for the sound of heaven. I I don't know if you've noticed it. You will now. After I mention it tonight, you will always notice this. But every place has its sound. If you, you, if you were to close your eyes and, and go into a certain place, even if you didn't know physically where someone would, had taken you, there are many places you could recognize by the sound. I, 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 was, uh, I was being drawn back to my childhood, and I was thinking about the sound in the mornings at my grandparents' house. Because I slept in, uh, if I was there overnight, which I was often, uh, I slept in a room that was nearest to the living area and the kitchen. And so I was where in a place where you could hear the sounds of the morning. Now, I can guarantee you that my grandparents, even if I'm getting up for school, my grandparents are still up much earlier than I was up. It didn't matter how early I got up, they were up well before me, always. And I would get up, and I would wake up, and I remember vividly my eyes popping open in that bed, and it was the same every time I was there and, and, and stayed over and woke up. Uh, there were two things that happened. I would, before I could even really make out anything clearly, you know, just, just my eyes barely opening in the morning in my bed, I could smell bacon <laughs> and coffee brewing. Always. But besides that, there were sounds that were always there. Now, I'm just going to tell you, in my grandparents' house, the sounds were pretty loud because Grandpa couldn't hear. He wore hearing aids. So whatever sounds there were had to be even louder than they would have needed to be for other folks. So I would wake up smelling bacon or sausage, and the next thing that would happen, I would hear that sausage sizzling. You know that sound? Now I'm making you hungry. <laughs> and I would hear that sound, but there were other sounds in the morning. The, uh, you know, if you dial it all the way back to when I, was, when I was young, there was one radio station in West Plains. One. There's about three now, but there was one then. KWPM. 1450 on your AM dial. Now, you could be sure that sounded great. KWPM. You know, a lot of people, a little piece of trivia that you never asked for, but I'm going to give you anyway. The call letters on a radio station don't have to stand for anything, but they always told us that it was keep West Plains moving. So, uh, So I would hear sausage sizzling, and then I would hear... KWPM on that AM radio and they had the the set that was huge and it was several pieces and it's almost a console in itself and that thing was turned up real loud real loud and it was the news they'd give the news and then they'd give the farm reports and always the hog prices because as if you've been around long enough, you remember me saying that West Plains, Missouri is the feeder pig capital of the world. Now, verifiable. We used to have it on a sign going into town, so it had to be true. At some point, they figured out that might not be as great an honor as we thought it was, so they took the sign down. But, um, we, we, no, I'm not going to say that. But, but there was always a lengthy a lengthy farm report uh, on that news on the radio that I would hear. The next thing that you would hear, and, and, and this was around 7 o'clock in, on the weekday mornings, was a lady named Mrs. P.S. Cree. Now, Mrs. P.S. Cree, her husband, had installed a weather station in their backyard. 
And for years, his whole life, then he died and then she took over. What would happen is at 7 o'clock, the radio station would make a phone call to Mrs. Cree. And she would have, she would have weather readings from the weather station that she would read over the air on this phone. And it was folksy, obviously. It was, but it was, you know, now you look back and you think, think it seems kind of goofy, but I thought it was normal. I thought this is what every town had. And so she would read this. And even when she was elderly, you couldn't understand her. And then there were the mornings where her dog would go to barking. And then somebody would knock on her door while she's on the radio. Somebody would call the other phone while she's on the radio. And they just let this go on and for years. And so I remember the sound of, of, of Mrs. Cree uh, always giving that weather report. And above all of it now... Because you've got, you've got the sound of the kitchen, you've got the radio going, and then the sound that was always above all of it was Grandma and Grandpa going back and forth with each other. Because they were always picking at each other. And, and, and they were always, and then, of course, Grandma would say something, it wasn't loud enough, what? What did you say? And she would repeat it, he'd say, no, that's not the truth. And so they go back and forth. And I just remember hearing this. Every morning it was the same way. Grandma and Grandpa's house had a sound. And if you immerse me in that today, with my eyes closed, I would know exactly where I was. There's this, I'm going somewhere, if you like, but I got stories tonight, so just let me tell them. It might get boring in a minute, so you better enjoy the stories. I was thinking about another place where I know the sounds real well. Uh, my favorite place to eat in the universe uh, outside of, well, I have two co-equal uh, eating establishments that I love that are outside of my wife's kitchen, which the best human cook in the world is my wife. Um, but if I'm not eating there, uh, her cooking, I have two places. I, and one of those places is at the lake. I've eaten there uh, uh, many times. I'm going to eat there next week. I know what day. I know what the menu is for that day. Uh, so I already know what I will order when I go in there. And uh, the place is called Hutchins Barbecue. Now, I don't ever get the barbecue there because I get the daily specials. Because you walk in and they've got a board where they have handwritten the specials for that day on the board. And I like it because I can get the fried green tomatoes. I can get fried squash. Uh, I can get stuff I don't get anywhere else. Uh, every Friday, you can either get the five-piece bluegill or the chicken and dressing. Uh, and so I think that's heaven. You know, that, that's... That's how I would eat every day, uh, and I don't. That's why I'm looking better and better all the time. But, but I realized when preparing this message that I know what that place sounds like. Because when you open the door there, I could, I could know it if I heard it right now without seeing it. You open the door at Hutchins, and the first thing that you don't notice, like you do in restaurants normally, is there's no music. There's no background music. That's, that's not a thing. But what you do hear is everybody talking. Everybody. And, and the reason you hear it is because they're not just talking to the people in their own booth or at their own table. They're talking to the people across the room because in Benton, Kentucky, everybody knows everybody. And they know when to get there because they all eat there at the same time every single day. And so, uh, so you walk in and you hear the talk. You also hear the talking from the kitchen. Why? Because there's a big window out where you can see right back in the kitchen. And you can hear what's going on in the kitchen. If, the, if those cooks are having a fight, you get to know about it. <laughs> and so you hear that. The glasses at Hutchins are not glass. And so they're plastic, big old plastic tumbers like they used to have at P the real Pizza Hut back in the day. You know, it's like that. So there's not glass clanging, but you hear plastic cups. You hear that's a specific noise. And you always hear that because there's people bustling and running everywhere, and they're always, it's always making noise. And, uh, and so uh, and I hear now, I've been there so much that I hear the familiar voices of the servers. You can tell who's working just by who you hear talking. Um, because that's, that place has its, its, own, its own sound. Every place has its sound. Heaven has a sound. Part of the atmosphere of heaven, when you look into it, 
How do I know what heaven looks like? Revelation chapter 4 and 5. You just want to see you into heaven, read Revelation 4 and 5. John got to see it. And one of the reasons he got to see it was so he could write it down. Because remember, the angel told him, write everything down. Then when it's time to not write down, he said, don't write this. But he did tell him to write this. And so he records for us what it looks like in heaven. Well, I think that might be because God wants us to know what heaven is like. There's things about heaven we don't know and won't know till we get there, but there's certain things we can know, and those things happen to be because God would like us to know them. And so when you look into heaven in Revelation 4 and 5, there's a lot that you see. There's a lot that's described that you see, but there's a lot that you describe that's described that you would actually hear. Because you find out, first thing, that there's a throne, and around that throne are these created beings that are always worshiping. And the way they're not just worshiping physically, they're worshiping verbally. And you hear them saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So the first thing that you realize is you are hearing worship. Then you find out that from the throne comes lightning. Well, you can see that, but there also comes thunderings, it says. You hear that. So now you've got worshipers. You've got thunder. Then you find out, the next thing it says is that from the, from the throne comes voices. Which makes sense because we know God has a voice. And from his throne he must be speaking. So in heaven you have worshipers, you have thunder, you have the voice of God. You turn over to chapter 5. And what you're going to do is you're going to add to that an angelic presence. And they're singing. And then... He backs out the, 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 the frame, the picture backs out to a larger scope and you realize now there's saints, there are people. They are also worshiping and singing out loud. So now in heaven you realize that it has its own sound. And when Jesus says, I want you to pray that your kingdom come and your will would be done. This is what we're telling God. So that as it is in heaven, it would be on earth. Part of that is the sound of heaven. And, and the promise is that we can pray for the kingdom to come and it be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Which means the sound of my home could begin to sound like heaven. Which means between my ears could begin to sound like heaven instead of the hell that the enemy tries to bring in all the time. If it can be on earth like it is in heaven, then if I found not just what it looks like but what it sounds like, it might just be that what comes out of my mouth would begin to sound like heaven instead of like the flesh, instead of like the earth, and certainly instead Instead of like what the enemy wants me to be saying, I can begin to sound like heaven because Jesus said I should pray for that. Sound is important. And the reason we need to understand the, the sound of heaven is because sound is important. Babies in utero come to identify mom's voice before the third trimester. They already know who mom is. Studies have shown that the sound of a mom's voice soothes and comforts the baby before as well as after its birth. The sound of mom's voice affects the physical condition of the baby, lowers its heart rate, calms its breathing. Studies of, uh, involving premature babies showed that those exposed to their mother's voice developed thicker auditory cortices than those who did not. So mom's voice stimulates growth and development in a child's brain. I'll say it again then. Sounds are important. Why do you think there's a draw even when you're expecting a child? Why do you think there's a draw and an inclination to speak to that child yet unborn? Because the sound, especially mom, it's important. The Lord knows and placed in his fingerprint on you the reality that it's important for you to talk to that baby even before that baby's born. You're enabling its development because of your connection, but the only connection you can have is not, it's not going to be visual yet. It's going to be verbal, and you can have that connection. Sounds are important. Think about how important sound really is. Sound informs us about people and about things and about the world around us. Sound unlocks a dimension of understanding that we don't have without it. And if you don't believe that, try watching 
a TV show without the volume up. And then get, I, I dare you to try this. It's almost fun. Watch about 15 minutes of a show with no volume and, and everybody in the room guess what the plot is. <laughs> then turn the volume up and see how wrong you all were. Because sound gives us information that we don't have without it. Sound is important. Because Jesus directed us that in praying for that kingdom to come and the will of God to be done on earth, that sound is part of heaven, so it should be part of our earth. We need to embrace every kind of revelation we can get about the heavenly world so that our world can begin lining up with his world. We're not trying to, to learn about God to bring him into our reality. No, our intention is to find revelation about God so that our reality lines up with his. His truth, his will, his word, his plans for us. So we're not, we're not trying to filter and interpret God and, and, and have him filter into our circumstances some way. We want to understand him and his realm and live in it, not just ask him to come and live in our world. We, we are asking to be able to live in his world. Sound, then, is an important part of that. And then it is worth asking, if sound is this important, what are you hearing? What sounds do you hear? What does it sound like between your ears? Often we'll go through a day, we have whatever thoughts we have, and we don't stop and evaluate those thoughts. Do these thoughts, does this train of thought about anything, myself, other people, my situations, the problems I'm trying to solve, the things I'm dealing with at work, what does it sound like? What's in my mind? Does that sound like me or does it sound like God? Does it sound like the enemy? Does it sound like the world or does it sound like God's word? We don't evaluate what it sounds like between our ears. Yet, we've already proven sound, what you hear, is very important. And inside of these brains, we're hearing things all the time. We're here, don't, don't you look down on somebody that they've said hears voices. You're hearing voices too? Come on now. We all are. And the question is, what, what voices are we hearing? And what voices do we allow to create our reality for us? Because if it's true that as it is in heaven, it can be on earth if I pray for that, then I want to feed off the sound of heaven and not off the sounds of this earth because there's a lot of sounds on earth right now. Lots of voices, lots of sounds, lots of opinions, lots of theologies, lots of, lots of things that have proven only to be destructive and unhealthy and ungodly. And all of those things have their voice. And so at some point I have to evaluate in my own mind, in my own heart, in my home, what does it sound like? Let me say it to you this way. When your children or grandchildren or when your neighbors or friends come in your home, what does it sound like to them? Does it sound like peace and order or does it sound like chaos and confusion? Does it sound like love and acceptance or does it sound like criticism and judgment? What does it sound like in my home? What does it sound like, pastors need to be asking this, what does it sound like in their church? What does it sound like when people walk in the door? Does it sound like love and receptivity and an open door to the heart of God? Or does it sound like, do they, do they get the subliminal message, whether it's verbal or not, that the sound is, you got to measure up here. You better be dressed a certain way here. See, because some of the sounds are very loud even though they're not spoken out loud. Don't sit over there. Don't make a noise here. Of course, here you make noise. We're not going to know the difference. I just think you're excited about Jesus. Make noise. I hope you do. But, but what does it sound like when somebody comes in my church? 
when it's time to pray, does it sound like we pray or does it sound like the pastor prays and everyone listens or sleeps? When we worship and there's music, does it sound like we're worshiping or does it sound like a few people are performing and the rest of us are just taking it in? What's it sound like? Every place in our life, we need to start evaluating the sound. What sounds are affecting it? Because all of the sounds are affecting us. The sounds between your ears, the sounds in your home are having their effect on you. You say, well, that's just how we talk to each other. Yeah, but if it's mean, it's having an effect on you. But that's just how we communicate. Yeah, but the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and gentleness so does it sound like gentleness and that's a fruit of the spirit your pastors had to work a lot on sounding gentle because I don't I sound kind of harsh and rude and mean a lot people that are close to me know that I'm 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 pretty much a teddy bear not very fuzzy I keep this shaved but But it doesn't matter what you are if people are so repelled by the way you come across that they never get to know it. And some of us, that's kind of a defense mechanism. We'll say, well, they they just don't know my heart, or well, but I'm just really good at heart. You know, I can't help my face, or I can't help the way I come across. Yes, you can. You can get sanctified. And I'll preach this one hard because I'm having to live through that myself. The first many years of our marriage, Erica having to remind me, People don't know that you were joking. (laughs) So, are you saying to me that I'm supposed to smile when I say something that I think is funny? Because I don't do that. I just say it, it's kind of half sarcastic, and I think you know that I'm just being that way. And she's like, no, people don't know you well enough. They... They think you're being mean. So I've had to start working on that. What sound is coming from your world? What sound is coming from your life? What do people hear when they get around you? By the things you say and the things that you don't say. What's it sound like? Does it sound like you're approachable? Does it sound like that you care and that you might have the voice of God and you might have answers? Does it sound like that you're a safe spot for them. Sound is important. Now, think about this. What was the first definitive action taken in the Word of God? Genesis 1-3. A sound was released. The first action, we're told that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, it's telling us you're about to have the description of creation. And then in verse 3, we are told... That God said. The first action taken in the Bible is God releasing a sound. And with that sound, everything in the world and in the universe came to be. Sound triggered creation. And what was that sound? It wasn't just any sound, it wasn't a snare drum, it wasn't breaking glass. What was the sound that triggered creation? The voice of God. The most important sound in the universe is the voice of God. You probably like the sound of your newborn baby. You like the sound. You like a lot of different sounds. Some of you gentlemen now or earlier in your life had a car that you particularly liked the sound of. Some of you do right now. The more burnout my muffler's getting on my truck, the more I'm liking the sound. You know what I mean? Jamie's with me on that one. Because the truth is, I'm not going to buy no glass packs, but I'm not going to spend any money. But once it gets burned just a little bit, you know, it sounds good. There's, There's sounds that are important to us, but 
the most important sound in the universe is the voice of God, which is why the enemy has such a vested interest in either muting that sound to you or confusing that sound to you. The voice of God, how he would speak to you, how he would lead you, how he would give you identity, how you, he would affirm or confirm or correct or really anything that he would want to communicate with us. The one who does bless us and gives us life, the one who has the help for us, he wants to communicate. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and the enemy heard him say that. So it became his assignment then to either mute that voice to us or confuse that voice to us. This is why one of the major questions, concerns that I deal with, the people that come to me for pastoral advice, involves, I don't know if I'm hearing God correctly. Or I don't think I hear God at all. Or is God speaking to me? That's why you hear that over and over again. That's why you've struggled with it. It's because the enemy has a vested interest in keeping you from either hearing or understanding God's voice. Because that's the most important sound. So he'll scramble into your brain with thoughts. He'll poison what God said with what he's trying to say. Or he'll introduce things to try to get you to mute the voice of God. You know how we mute the voice of God? We can mute the voice of God. And here's one of the ways we do it. By turning all the other voices up. We get so many tabs on our mind open, just like my computer right now. We're at the point with my computer in the office, it's, it's a lot of years old. I have a desktop that is a lot of years old. But I can just tell you, on this year's budget, there is, no pa- there is no computer for pastor. That is not part of our game plan. So I know I'm going to get to just, I'm just going to get to ride it out. And we're not sure... Is the computer got a lot of problems or you just keep too much stuff open all the time? It might be that. We do that with our minds. And then what happens? When I have all that stuff open, suddenly everything slows down, gums up. I can't get anything to work. I can't access files. Today, I had a Word document and I literally, I literally, I, I, I was scrolled over onto it was studying for something, and I had, I had the mouse over here on the, on the Bible. All I did was click on the Word document just to get the mouse over there so I could type. And it had to go into the spinning wheel of death. You know the one I'm talking about. Because I'd ask it to do too hard a thing. Just to click on the document. I didn't ask it to, I didn't type anything. It had to think for literally about a minute before that cursor started flashing and I knew I could type now. That's exactly what happens with us when we have too many files open, too many tabs open, too many windows open. We're we're so distracted with many things. And what did Jesus say to Martha? He didn't say the things weren't important that she was doing. He just said There's a better part than what you're doing right now. And it is Mary has chosen it. Because Mary was doing one thing. How do you know Martha was doing more things? Because the Bible says, I'm sorry, I have to quote the King James because that's just all I can quote. She was cumbered about with, what did it say? Much serving. Much. There were many things she was distracted with. Mary sat down and was focused on one thing. Just the Lord. So she was hearing him. She was connecting with him. She was learning from him. She was developing a relationship with him because she was focused on him. And yet our lives are such that it's easy to enter into a hundred distractions. And then God may be speaking to us, but it's hard to hear it because we've got this and we've got that and we need to tend to that and this is on the schedule and i got to remember to do that and I don't want to forget this person. And we open so many tabs until we mute the voice of God in our life. And if we don't mute the voice of God in our life, then what the enemy does is he'll whisper things to us to confuse the issue of what God might be saying. For instance, he'll take something you may be studying, believing for, praying in the Word, the written Word of God, that it should be obvious. Ever had this happen? 
and suddenly you're twisted up about something that's very plain on the page. But you're wondering, well, I don't know, does that apply to me? Did God really mean that? Did he mean it for now? Did he? And, and all of these things, and it amounts to confusion. The enemy just introduced that to you. Why? Because the worst thing that could happen to him is for us to get very convinced about the word of God and then live it. And so he's always trying to introduce, if we won't mute the word, then he'll try to confuse the word. What's he doing? He's just trying to suppress the voice of God in our life. I can prove all this. Satan wanted to get his sound into Jesus' ears more than once. After just hearing, in Luke 3, at his baptism, Voice from heaven, audible voice of the Father. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So now he's, he's convinced of his identity. If he needed verbal confirmation, he got it. You turn the page to Luke 4. What's the very next voice the Bible records that he hears? Satan saying, he just heard, you are my beloved Son. The next voice we know that he hears says to him, well, if you be the Son of God, that sounds exactly what the enemy does to us. We just about get a hold of who we are, what God's called us to do, or what the instruction is. We just about get a hold of something in the Word, and then shoo, here comes this thought and derails it all. That's not just you. That's a plan from the enemy. He wanted to sow that voice into Jesus' mind because he was trying to poison the the voice of the Father in his mind. It happened another time. It's Matthew 16. Look how quickly these tables turn. Just in case you feel that you're somehow off balance or, or, or you're up and you're down and something's wrong with you, Jesus went from hearing from the Father in one moment to hearing from Satan in the next. There's nothing wrong with you. This happened to Jesus as well. And then look at what happens in Matthew 16. In one moment, Peter has an absolute revelation from God. Jesus said it was. Because he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My father had to reveal this to you. So Peter, with all of his issues, was able to have a revelation. Now, I'm going to suggest that to you. You, with all of your issues, can have a revelation from God. Amen. Getting revelation from God is not a maturity issue. Knowing what to do with revelation is a maturity issue. But getting the revelation you need from God, you don't have to be grown up in God for God to show you the things you need to see. He wants to help you like that. And in this moment, what was the revelation that Peter got? Well, Jesus had asked, well, who do you say I am? And Peter says, well, you're the, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you couldn't have known that on your own. That was a revelation from the Father that you just got. And it seems like, Peter would say, ching I got it right. I got something right. <laughs> Hold on, Peter. Just a few verses later, Jesus is talking about that he's going to have to go to the cross. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to rise from the dead. And then Peter now takes him aside. And out of the same mouth that just confessed a revelation from God, out of that same mouth comes a revelation from Satan. Because he says, Lord, far be it from you that this would ever happen, what you're talking about. I'm talking about the cross. And how does Jesus respond? How do we know that's the voice of Satan? Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't calling Peter Satan. But what had happened was, Satan wanted to find a mouth he could speak through. Because he wanted those words going in Jesus' ears. And I love Jesus because he knew what to do with it. Both times. In the wilderness, if you be the son of God, make these stones become bread. And basically, he just says, no, shut up, and here's what the Bible actually says. And then when Peter spews this stuff from Satan, well, the cross will never, we can't let that happen to you. Jesus doesn't let that marinate one moment in his mind. He rebukes the devil for what he said, and he makes sure to get that away from his thoughts before it has time to settle. Just take a lesson. It's not part of the message, but just take a lesson from Jesus there. 
do not let enemy thoughts have time to settle here. Don't marinate on them. Don't think on them. Don't ruminate on them. The minute you know, that doesn't sound like the word, well, then it's got to go. It's got to go. So the enemy, he wants to destroy our hearing of God's voice because God's voice is powerful and important. Now, the voice of God is so powerful that it does some things. The voice of God is responsible for some important things. First of all, the voice of God is responsible for creation. Genesis 1-3 again, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And then Genesis records eight more times in that chapter that God said, and then whatever he said would come to be. So God's voice is responsible for creation. Well, pastor, that was the creation. That was Genesis 1. Is that still true? Is God still creating? Seems to me like that we're done with that now. Isn't that just Genesis 1, 2, and you're saying God's voice is responsible for creation? That's a great question. You theologian, you. Romans 4, 17, though. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls, present tense, those things which do not exist as though they did. For a thousand years after God created everything with his voice, Paul says God is still creating things with his voice because he's calling things that are not as though they were. God's voice still creates. Why is that important to me? Because when it seems like there isn't a way for you through to the promise God made, it doesn't matter if there's not a way. God's still a creative God. His voice still creates. I see no way that my child gone astray for 20 years that I've been praying for could possibly, at this point, as hard as he is, rebellious as he is, deceived as he is, I see no way he could come home to God. It doesn't matter if there's no way. Even if there's not no way. You still get a call on Friday night that says, God found a way. God made a way. If there's, I'm, I'm just trying to get you to realize, it does not matter if there really isn't a way. God will create whatever he needs to. I got another one. Somebody in this room had to forgive me for mentioning it. But when the doctor says... There is no connective tissue in your shoulder to enable you to lift, work, move, have any range of motion in your shoulder. It's not there. It does not exist. So there's no way that you can work, no way you can lift, and no way you can move your shoulder. When God says there is a way, he makes one, and that testimony is sitting in this room right now to the point of well, should we do surgery? No, because if, doctor speaking now, if we do surgery, what we have to do will put you restricted because we'll connect this up and you won't be able to do what you're able to do right now with no tissue. Why? Because God said there's a way. He's made one. He just decided to make one. It doesn't matter if there's no order or peace in your mind. Let God's word speak to your thoughts and watch him create a sound mind. Amen. You say, but I'm just confused and I'm just, you may be. But God can create order with your confusion. When his word enters into it, God's voice still creates. That's part of the sound of heaven. And you know what we get to do? We're not just recipients of that sound. We get to echo that sound. Mark eleven twenty three. 23. For assuredly, ooh, ooh, I feel good things right now. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, now he's not talking about God, he's talking about us. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever, whatever he says. That must be why Proverbs says that the power of, of life and death is in the tongue. 
Because life and death is in the power of the tongue. Because it's in the power of God's tongue and he made us in his image and in his likeness. Therefore, what we say also has power. <clears throat> and I submit to you, we do have whatever we say. Yes. You already do. Because when you're the person that is talking about God answering the prayer, having the breakthrough, getting the victory, when you're talking about what God's promises are, when you are talking about your faith being built, you growing, then I can tell you, if that's what you're talking about, then that's what you're going to have. You, when you hear somebody talking like that, they do have victory. They are going to get their breakthrough. God will answer their prayers. They are growing. They, if that's what I hear you saying, that is what you will have. That is just the way that it works. That is the, but I can guarantee you something on the other side. When it is the person that only their only testimony is about how dark it all is, I don't know if we're going to make it, seems horrible, I'm overwhelmed. I'm not just talking about admitting where you are, but I mean this is your constant verbiage. This is your constant, what flows out of you is how bad this circumstances is. I don't know if there's a way. Let I me mean, just tell you, you're going to stay stuck right where you're at. You will have what you say. You'll have exactly what you say, in fact. By the way, you'll have exactly what you say over your kids. You won't have what you hope for your kids. You will have what you say over your kids and pray over your kids. That's what you'll actually have. You know, I hope they grow up to be healthy and they know who they are and in God, and yet everything you say to him tears him down. Your hopes will not contradict your words. It got kind of quiet, so I'll move on. Sneak out of that room and into another one. So the question is, what sound are you making with your words? Do they sound like heaven or do they sound like earth? Is the sound that comes out of me the sound of gratitude or of complaining? Is the sounds that come out of me about faith or doubt? Is the sound that comes out of me about confidence or fear? Is the sound that comes out of me love and grace or criticism and judgment? We are creating the atmosphere of either heaven or earth by matching the sound of one of those places with our words. I want to match heaven. Now the voice of God is also not just responsible for creation, but it's responsible for direction. Isaiah 30, 21. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. I mean, this is, this is navigation device before navigation devices. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Well, that's Old Testament. Is there a New Testament for that, Pastor? Yes, there is. John chapter 16, verse 13. Jesus said, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he guides us into all truth. So that is the voice of God directing us into his ordered steps for our lives. Last weekend, when Brianna was, we were at Tunica running a barrel race, and um, thank you. Um, just an update. We weren't in the money on either of our barrel runs. She had almost her best barrel run in that arena, but we weren't in the money, but we, we were on the money on the pole run, so we were happy about that. Uh, I can't say that we covered our entry fees or even a tank of gas, but hey. Placing is placing, whether it pays out much or not. Um, but we were already there on Friday afternoon, and Bill and Sherry are going to come. Well, Bill's going to come and watch on Friday afternoon. And so if you've been to Memphis lately, you know there's some issues traffic-wise. And, um, in fact, the old bridge is closed. And uh, so both interstates, traffic are going across the new bridge. And so that becomes a little bit confusing if you're trying to go south. Because if you're coming through Memphis and you're trying to go to Jackson, and you're trying to go to South Haven or anywhere south, Birmingham, wherever, then you've got, a whole, you've got to do a whole thing because you've got to come into town and go a different way. Bill is on his way, and he calls me. I'm already, I'm already at the race, and he calls and says, hey, I'm on my way. 
you know, the traffic is bad, and I'm trying to, this is not the way we normally come to come down here, so how, you know, tell me, and I walked him through, I said, well, you're going to get off on 240 going south after you pass St. Jude, and, uh, and then you're going to get down there, and when you get to 55, you're going to go north for one exit and get off on 61 going south straight to Tunica, that'll take you there. He called me so that I could speak to him the directions. I spoke, this is, make this turn, go this far, make this turn. I spoke directions to him. I talked him through it. That's exactly how the voice of God wants to direct our lives. Every step of the way, there's a voice that'll be behind you saying, here's the way, walk in it. When you turn to right, when you turn to left, he's making it clear this is about every decision you make. Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. In other words, if you're a child of God, you can be led by the Spirit of God. And it doesn't say, what do we do? We, we get Spirit-led in the big decisions. Take this job or don't take this job. You know, uh, do this with my money or do that with my money. Big decisions, we think like that. But what if we decided, I'm going to be led by the Spirit in every decision, every word, every response I make, the way I handle people at work, the way I handle my situations. Lord, your word says, I'm your child, so I can be led by your spirit. And you didn't put parameters and say, well, it's only if, oh, it's, only if it's a big magnitude. No. I start claiming what the word actually says. And I start saying, well, Lord, I'm going to let you lead me with everything. And you know what? The Holy Spirit is there to do it. It's just we don't often give him the time or the room to do it. We running ahead. We're already stepping forward, and he's saying, hey, hold on a minute. We're already speaking, and he's trying. <laughs> or at least he's trying to adjust what might come out. And sometimes the only reason we're not following him is just, we're just not giving him time. We're not yielded. We're not listening. Maybe we didn't know we could be led. Heaven has a sound. It's the voice of God. He's speaking by his spirit, directing us into the ordered steps he already made for us. And we navigate his, our lives by that direction in the small and the great. Now, not only is the voice of God responsible for creation and direction, but it'll also be responsible for our resurrection. Rhonda, you can come. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. I'm just proving to you here that the sound of heaven is important. The voice of God is important all the way through our life. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord will not by no means precede those who are uh, asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be in the Lord. It makes sense that the voice of God that was responsible for creation the voice of God responsible for our direction is also the voice of God that's going to be responsible for our evacuation from this earth. He put us here by his voice. He's led us here by his voice. And one day his voice is going to call us out of here. It's all about, this is how important the voice of God is. And it's so evident that that is why the enemy opposes us hearing It's amazing that those of us who spend our lives coming to know his voice, prioritizing voice, listening to his voice, if you've done that, it won't be any stretch for you to recognize his voice on that day when he says, come up here. Because that's the voice you've been leaning into your whole life. I'm looking forward to hearing that call. We don't know when it'll be, but until then, I'm listening every moment because his voice is the most important sound in the world and it is certainly the sound of heaven let's pray Father thank you that you are not mute thank you that you do speak to us you have given us your amazing word and you have given us your Holy Spirit to guide us into the truth of your word you're directing us and leading us you're communicating with us you pour your your heart and your truth into us. Thank you, Father, for the sound of heaven. And I pray that we would tune our ears into the sound of heaven and away from the sounds of the earth. We'd be submitted to that sound. Now, my 
question tonight as your eyes are closed. Have you heard the sound in your heart of the Lord Jesus calling you to a relationship with him? Speaking to you that you're away from God and there's things in your life it's called sin it separates you from God and, and that he wants you to come because what he intends to do is to forgive that sin then he intends to make you a new person and give you a new life and a new future in him this is one of the things the Holy Spirit does he guides us to Jesus have you heard him speak that in your heart and then did you respond to it and I, I'm aware that tonight it's possible that there's somebody that hasn't responded to that call. The Lord's called you. His voice has spoke, spoken to you, but maybe you haven't come to him yet. Perhaps tonight is your night. So I'd love to know if that's you. I just want to know to pray for you. So if you say, you know what, I hear the Lord calling me to a relationship with him, and I've never answered, but I know that I need to. I want to pray for you. If that's you, just raise your hand and put it down, and then I'll know to pray. Anyone in this room? Well, Heavenly Father, if there's someone here, if there's someone online watching who has never responded to your call, I pray this night would be the night. I pray this would be the night, just like Romans 10 describes, when they would confess that they, that they know that you, you died and rose from the grave for them, and they would confess their sin to you, and then they would confess you to be their Lord and turn their life over to you. I pray that tonight in Jesus' name. I want you to agree as we stand together. You can go ahead and stand as we get ready to dismiss. I want you to agree with me two things as you pray over yourself tonight. First of all, that you're going to take that opportunity to echo God's voice with your voice. So that when he says, we can speak to the mountains, what he would say. Evidently, he would tell them to move and we get to too. That we would use our mouth to echo what's, what he's saying from heaven. And not just speak from our mind, our feelings. But we would speak for God through our own mouth. And then second, that we'd be spirit-led, that we would listen also for his voice. And that's how we would make our lives, decisions, and directions would you, just, would you pray about that as we get ready to leave? Father, we want to give our mouths to you tonight in Jesus' name because we want to echo what you say. Your words are true. Your words, you will be faithful to, to back up those words. And so, Father, we want to lend our mouths to be the echo of the sound of heaven. Lord, make us aware of the opportunities we have to do that. Convict us so that we'll, we'll be drawn, Lord, to speak what you would say in every situation. And Lord, beyond that, we open our ears. Not just in the great issues, but even in the small issues, to be led by your spirit, by your voice, by your word. Lord, we open our ears to be spirit-led. And Lord, when we live, when we work, move, speak, love, serve, I pray that it would be, I pray it would sound like heaven to the people that come in contact with us that they would come to find out what heaven's like because they came into our lives and that you would be glorified in it and they would be drawn to you. And I thank you that you'll use us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's been such a treat to worship with you tonight. Hope that we'll see you soon. God bless you as you go uh, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. God bless.